the youngest daughter. Um, so, uh, where to start? I don't really know how such an interesting life or even a single complicated relationship could be summed up, though Eric seems to have done an excellent job. <laughs> It's, it's very difficult for me to remember mother when she, when, from when I was little, when she was my age now, nearing 40, and we all, all lived in the house next door. Uh, unlike my sister, I don't have many clear memories um, from my early childhood at all, just a few scattered little video clips in my head. Uh, but one that I love is the one that I remember when I was about two and mother was trying to teach me to read. She decided to label everything in our living room. And she put up taped up index cards on everything. Table, sofa, credenza, credenza <laughs> hassock. Words <laughs> every two-year-old needs. <laughs> I saw a big girl of four or five, maybe at the time, tells me she even labeled the cat. <laughs> great detail about her recent life. It's, um, as all of you know, it was, it was a challenging period for her. Um, instead, I, I really found myself thinking about her qualities in general, and her talents, her skills, and piecing together how they contributed, contributed to who I am. There are so many aspects of her that I am grateful that she did pass along to me. Her liberal bent, her love of language, her delight in beautiful things. When I find myself doing three things at once, I think of Mother standing in the kitchen tethered to two telephones, reheating her morning coffee and scribbling something all at the same time. <laughs> Was there ever a more prolific multitasker? <laughs> Sometimes when I find myself piping like the wind, I look down and I almost expect to see her long fingers flying over the keyboard. I wish I could have inherited more of her confidence, not to mention her uh, speaking in public. I'm in pretty right now. Um, I also might wish for more of her optimism and her belief that every difficult situation and every even, even seemingly impossible situation would somehow work itself out. Um, it, it so often did for her. She was never a worrier. She always believed in the kindness of strangers and in the generosity of her friends. One of her greatest talents was in her ability to connect with people and to connect those people to others. And this is my opportunity to tell you all how grateful I am that she connected with you and that we got to connect with you as well. Um, in particular, I want to um, talk about Anita a little bit. Anita. You were her rock for so many years, and ours, in such an unstable world. Um, you handled the concrete details of her life while she plunged into everything around her. She served as her co-conspirator, her sounding board, her business manager, crowd control, and most important to me, you served as her surrogate mother. <laughs> Here you are organizing and contributing to her final gathering, so it's so appropriate. delighted seeing the connections between everyone gathered here today, knowing that she had played a role in building that web of <coughs> partnerships and alliances, agreements and viewers of family and friends. in me right now. Um, Barack Obama's done all the great speeches. <laughs> and speaking of Barack Obama, boy was she excited. And I, I wish that she had lived to see the election day. She would have voted for sure. She would have voted right, you know. I mean, she would have been on the side that won. Yes. Um, 
she was with us. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I should I should mention. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, but I did one of the things I found in her belongings was her sample ballot and her voter information guide. Uh -huh. And so she had been already been filling it all out. Uh -huh. She was waiting for the day. I used to I used to call her occasionally to find out what was the um, what was the um, <laughs> what was the scoop on something because I didn't know I didn't know that much about politics. I kind of got into politics a little bit more after George W. Bush was elected or sort of elected or whatever happened there. Um, <laughs> her in. She was not the kind of person that you could uh, describe really easily. Um, Tolstoy said in, uh, I think it was Anna Brennan, he said, all happy families are happy in the same way and all unhappy families are unhappy in different ways. And in this, a similar but less pessimistic vein, all normal mothers are more or less similar to each other, <laughs> but all unusual mothers <laughs> are unusual in very different and eccentric ways. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she was she was generous, she was a visionary, she was a crazy old cat lady. Sure. Sure. Um, she was uh, there was a point, I'm not kidding, where she had, you know, in the dozens of cats before we kind of zoomed in and controlled that. Um, loved them. She loved them. Um, she had five when she died. Um, anyway, uh, here are a few thoughts about her. She she loved lowbrow food. I'm sure some of you will remember she had this wonderful idea that she wanted to host a um, a banquet for junk food. Remember? Yes. Okay. Twinkies on silver salvers. Root beer floats and crystal goblets. You know, that was her idea. It was the most wonderful thing. And she loved, oh, lemon meringue pie was a sacrament to her. That woman, that was the most important. She, actually, in more recent years, she would go down to then Lucky Supermarket at Lovely Hill, and she would buy, two at a time, lemon meringue pies. And she wouldn't even bother with a knife or a plate. She just took a fork to the tin. And she'd go through about a pie a day, but she didn't eat much else, and she was little as a bird. Anyway, she was, uh, she was just <coughs> something else with that. Um, at one time, I, speaking of lemon rain pie, I picked three lemons off of my newly purchased lemon tree that I planted in the backyard, and I don't think it ever subsequently furnished any lemons at all, but anyway, they were beautiful, and I wanted to make something special, and I thought, I know, I'll make a lemon rain pie like my mom has never had, it'll be made with all the right ingredients. With oh. Throw butter in the crust, and I'm going to put the vanilla bean in the meringue, and I'm going to make you know the lemon curd with the zest and the lemons. And I gave it to her. She tasted it. She said, "Really good. It reminds me of the Lucky Supermarket pies." <laughs> <laughs> I have to brag a little. Um, she was maybe four or five years old, and her sister was teaching her to write in cursive. And she took, she decided to write her name, Emily, in cursive on the pristine walnut surface of my antique dresser <laughs> with an earring back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so. Uh, I was livid, and my mother, who was visiting, said, you go out, you have some coffee or something, go and get some, some air. And while I was gone, she burnished, and she inked in the marks, and she took some <laughs> old English to it, and she came, and when I came back, she proudly just like, you could barely see it. She did not want me to be mad at my daughter, but most particularly, I think she didn't want me to be mad at Emily for writing. <laughs> <laughs> and Emily is now quite a remarkable writer. 
<laughs> more bragging, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I used to joke that if she lost everything and ended up on the streets of Highland Park, she would undoubtedly delight in the various homeless inflicts she'd meet, and she would wax enthusiastic about the quality of the food that you could get from the local dumpsters. <laughs> I was sure that that's what would happen, because this woman was the most positive, often irrationally and frustratingly positive person that I have ever met. <laughs> and I know that if you know, life gave her lemons, well, she'd make lemon meringue pie, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. At this point, I think Kim Bechtel, my mother's cousin, is on the speakerphone. Kim, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We hear you quite well. And if everybody could just turn, I don't know, to the extent you can, right. turn. Yeah. We had to place the speakerphone back in that corner. Do we want to take this microphone over there? Um, this yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. This is recording. No, I So, Kim, if you're ready, I think everybody here is... <clears throat> We're listening. Hi, Kim. He's listening. <laughs> Will the microphone cord reach? Um, we've got one mic. It's, it's not an oh, amplifier, you know. It's only for recording. It's just a handset. <laughs> just talk nice and loud. All right, I'm not sure hearing you. Are you hearing me? Yes. yes. So just talk nice and loud. Okay, great. We'll get started again. Good afternoon, everyone. I regret not being with you, but a serious illness and a family member is keeping me in Colorado. With me on the phone is my brother, Wayne Bechtel, and our cousin, Diana Wyatt, um, and, and several others will be joining in and out as we go through the afternoon. Marilyn was my cousin. She was my sister. Our mothers were sisters, and we each had no other sister. She was born six months ahead of me. We grew up spending summers and Christmases together. We raised our babies, talked of our deepest love grew older together, often in different cities and always on different life paths, but nonetheless connected. Rowan was involved in our company, our new company that's developing genetic testing for neuropsychiatric disorders, and she loved it. Rowan came from a family of artisans and musicians on her father's side and a family of inventors, explorers, and adventurers on her mother's side. Her grandfather, Nuzio Grosso, born in Ricci, Italy, immigrated to the United States as a teenager in 1870. He was a master stonemason, as were his three sons, including Marilyn's father, Mike. Phenomenally well known, they built churches, schools, monuments all over western Colorado, including the visitor center at the top of the Colorado National Monument. They were original settlers of the Grand Valley, a breathtaking valley situated beneath massive red sandstone cliffs of the same magical outcroppings as the Valley, Arizona. Brown's father was Italian, handsome, beyond belief, brilliant, and had such perfect recall that he played concert-level piano without having taken a single music lesson. Her mother, Helen Bauer, was beautiful, high-spirited, and had Marilyn's generosity and kindness. Her mother and father fell in love in high school and eloped without the family's permission because the German-American Lutheran Bauer family would not have countenance a daughter marrying an Italian Catholic, no matter how handsome he was. <laughs> Marilyn's grandparents and on her mother's side came from a line of people who migrated from the safety of home and family into a new land and a new adventure twice in three generations. Lured by the offer of Catherine the Great, German wife of Russia's Peter the Great, of free land, a cow, and freedom from, from conscription for 100 years, our great-grandparents accepted the challenge to move from Germany to farm the untilled lands of, along the Volga River, lands the Russians were incapable of farming, and lands that were too close to the Mongols for the Russian appetite. Our grandfather was an inventor. We even have a picture of a rotary tiller he invented in the old country. Seeing the looming clouds of revolution on the horizon in Bolshevik Russia, our great-grandfather decided to move his large family to the New World, to America. The first to leave was his daughter, Catherine, our grandmother. Her husband, Johann Jorik, shared three babies, and his, and his youngest daughter, Mary, sent along to help take care of the babies during a long ocean voyage and settling in the new land. The rest of the family were to follow. Unfortunately, this was not to be. So 
soldiers came in the dead of winter and in the darkest night and sent the family from their rich farm and land, their camel herds, and their livelihood. Story has it that our great grandfather died that night of heartbreak. The mothers and daughters and sons tried to find enough grain left in the fields behind the harvesters, but eventually were sent to the cold and barren Siberian colonies to the north. Our grandmother and grandfather in this country worked day and night for money to send food and clothing to their mothers, sisters, and brothers left behind, but no word was ever heard from Russia. In this country, our grandfather and grandmother found the Grand Valley of, the West, of Western Colorado and called it home because of the railroad. Our father was a master blacksmith. Marilyn and her brother, two brothers grew up there during the Second World War and the beginning of the Vietnam War era. Marilyn's high school was smallish in a city of 25,000. Her lifelong friend, Dr. Johanna Kwong, is here today. Marilyn and her mother exhibited an extraordinary joy in their children. You all, I'm sure, saw this. Marilyn even breaking with her mother and raising her children in a freer and more open and loving and far less restrictive manner. Her conversations with me were always punctuated with the wonderful thing that Eric said that day or Chris's cute words about some event. I have so many, many stories of her life that I would love to have the time to tell you. Um, but that would take forever. And there is just one, but there is just one you must hear. When we were about eight years old and playing in the backyard of Maryland's home in Grand Junction, we drove a stick into the dry Colorado earth and made quite a deep hole. Marilyn put her ear to the hole and sat back with a look of awe and total wonder. She told me quickly to come and listen. She said, did you hear it? I, of course, being less gifted, said, hear what? Incredulous and supremely thrilled, she said, the sound, the sound of the earth. And so you see that while she came from a long line of adventurers and pioneers, she herself was destined to be the all-time adventurer, the world-class explorer, the discoverer, the kind and generous pathfinder for yet a newer world, a newer age, a new world not of lands and people and enterprise and wars, but a new land of mind and wisdom, of charity and love. And as Barack Obama put it in his address in Baltimore on the train ride to the Capitol, of a new declaration of independence from ideology and small thinking, prejudice and bigotry and narrow interest and appeal, not to our easy instincts, but to our better angels. I know we have all seen the new world, new age explode once again on the scene before our eyes with the election and inauguration of, pre of President Barack Obama. Maryland did not leave us without knowing that this was going to happen. She did not leave us before she had the assurance that the seeds of a new time had been sown and that the world was continuing its transformation never to be the same again. <laughs> After she left this physical plane and the election moved to victory, my constant thought was that she always said that we of the conspiracy were not necessarily the leaders of the new age, rather, we had come into the world to prepare for those who would follow, those who would be the new age, the children who would be born into a world where the lamps had been lit, where the path had been paved, and that they, then, would transform the world. I can't help but think that the president, our children, the young people who made sure he was elected, are the new age leaders for whom Maryland and we have paved the way. That brings me to the most important thing that I would like to say to you today, or say today to you, her dearest friends and her family. Two extraordinary things have happened in Maryland's life. One happened to the world, it happened because of Maryland's leading light, her brilliance, her giving completely of herself, her awe and wonder at the power of the mind, the power of people working for the better good. And what happened for her? And that is... And, 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 it is that for which I would like to make a special tribute today. I knew Marilyn Ferguson before she had all of you in her life. I knew her when she was a strikingly beautiful young woman who was but a poet and a writer. When you all started to come into her life, she too transformed. She grew and she inhaled all of your spirits, all of your grace, 
all of your compassion and your compassion for each other and for the community of man. She passed it all back to you, of course, to her readers and to her loved ones, to her family. And she was coming out. She was becoming who she was truly meant to be. Most important, she was becoming who she was meant to be because of you. So today, we, her family, her cousins, Jan, Jan Erickson is there today. We want to thank you, first of all, Chris and Harmon, Eric and Suzanne, Lynn and Jeff. You and your children were her joy, her ultimate love, and you were her pride. We want to thank her husband, John Resselman, Mike Ferguson, Ray Gottlieb, and those men in her life who she loved it deeply. You were her foundation, her companions, her trusted friends. And more than anything, we want to give our deep and heartfelt thanks to all of the rest of you here today and those who have written and shared their memories and commemorations and those who are here in spirit and those whose research, life work, and philosophy so thrilled and inspired our cousin and filled her bullets and her books. Thank you for your amazing contributions to her life and for your work and your contributions to this great land and its people and to the shifting sands beneath our feet that has brought us to this bright and courageous new age she so brilliantly heralded and named. She would want me to say the following to you, and we, her family, also sincerely say this to you, that she thrived because of your love. She found her own strength through your strength. She triumphed because of your admiration. She was courage, courageous in her life because of your courage in living your lives. She could dream her dreams because you were dreaming your dreams. She could plan and build her hopes for the new world because you were planning. And you were building your hopes for the new world right along with her. And she would want to tell me that you were the wind beneath her wings. On this coming Monday, a solar eclipse occurs and involves a triple conjunction to the sun, moon, and Jupiter. Normally, the eclipse would come in pairs, and mystics speak of the two weeks between the solar and the lunar eclipse as a time when a portal opens to another world full of extraordinary possibilities. For me, Marilyn will leave us now, returning often, of course, to move through this portal to another world. It is a world that is waiting in darkness, waiting spiritless, waiting without the knowledge of personal power, waiting for a leader, a pathfinder, a lamplighter, a dream weaver. There on a grassy hill was a young girl, <laughs> brown eyed, sweet and kind, who will once again put her ear to the ground and hear the journey, hear the sound of that world who will be thrilled and in awe of that primal sound and who will begin the journey once again for those people in that time and in that space. Remember, she is not traveling alone. She is traveling with you and with your love for her forever. Thank you. I actually have it already. Okay. I have it. Okay. Thank you, Kim. And Thank I you. She wants to put that. recordings have been um, recovered and sent around by email and everything else by people who have had these wonderful things in their vaults. I don't know if we have anything here and now. Okay. Peter, Peter, Peter say who you are. Just an idea. Peter. Peter Russell. Peter Russell. Marilyn changed my life. Made my life. In many, many, many ways. One, she introduced me to Jeremy. She published The Global Brain. He called it his Vietnam at one stage, but we got through that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still going on. More than that, just the, 
the other people, the ideas. She taught me how to edit myself. So many inspiring times, magical times, crazy times. But I wouldn't, not only would I be here, obviously, but I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for now. She was, she was a real mentor, one of the most important people in my life. Just a few anecdotes, a couple of short anecdotes. One was when I first met Marilyn. It was in the late 70s, I can't remember the exact year, probably about 77, 78. She just started the brain mind policy. And I was in England, and I somehow had a nose for what was going on, and I found the Brain Mind Bulletin, and I subscribed, and she came to England, and she decided, she'd look up some of her subscribers, she had six subscribers in England. <laughs> the first phone number she picked me up was mine, she rang me up, and she said, can we meet? <laughs> so we met at some cafe in Knightsbridge with three kids in turn, I think Eric must be about ten, or something then. And we just hit it off. We just hit it off. We realized we had parallel lives. When she was writing the Brain Revolution, I was writing the Brain Book. She was writing the Great Conspiracy, I was writing the Global Brain. We sort of lived parallel lives. We were always sparking each other. And I would come to Mount Washington. I'd always I'd be passing through giving a talk from her. I'd come and visit and I'd be staying the night and Ray always reminded me that if I come for a day I'd stay for three or four. One little story which I think just summed up the parallel. We were at a hotel in Amsterdam. If I was Marilyn was in Europe, I'd, I'd put everything down just to go and where she was, and I knew it was going to be fun, worthwhile, <laughs> inspiring. And I remember, Ray maybe correct my memory, but I, as I remember, it was that Marilyn was sitting on a bed in a hotel being interviewed by somebody, and this interviewer was doing what interviewers sometimes do, it's like they start interrupting you when you're, and Marilyn suddenly said, stop. Let's just stop here for a moment. Let me just tell you how to interview. You <laughs> 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 said so beautifully and gently and generously as you gave the interviewer a sort of little three minute introduction. <laughs> interview. I said, now do the interview. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was valid. And just then today is David Frost. Sorry? Today. And that then today is David Frost. <laughs> David Frost, yes. <laughs> and she was right. Yes. <laughs> she was right. She was usually right. Yes, she usually was right. And all with the synchronicity that was always around. Another thing that struck me about that was anything was possible. Anything was possible. And another of her visits to England is. Let's go and interview Colin Wilson. <laughs> and Ray was there, and Mary and Will jumped in a car, rang up Colin Wilson, drove down to Cornwall, went and stayed with Colin Wilson, which was a great time, and got back home, and Mary and my partner were trying. My mother said to her, what did you do at the weekend? Well, we went down and stayed with Colin Wilson. She said, what? She thought she was totally joking, but that was Mary. Any, anything was possible. Nobody was out for a week. Anyway, I'll say in a while, I'm just loving just hearing all the stories, the anecdotes. She was, she was the emblem of the New Age and the champion. She was the figurehead. And I don't think, I don't think the world would be where it is now. She was a real significant player in the game.